All right, everybody, welcome back to the Contracting Handbook. I'm your host, Mike Kenoki, and today I'm joined by Robin Clevett. He's a carpenter by trade. He's a YouTube star with 67,000 subscribers. He loves roofs. He's a timber framer extraordinaire. But if you go to his YouTube site, you'll see he does all things residential, or maybe he would call it domestic. Um, so, Robin Clevett, welcome to the show. Thanks, Mike. It's really nice of you to have me. Yeah, it's great to have you here. Uh, I've been enjoying your uh, your YouTube channel and Fix Radio, of course. Um, so let's start with you telling the audience a little bit about your your YouTube channel and what you do. Well, the, U- the YouTube channel was basically something that evolved um, because I was always an avid photograph taker of my work. So whenever I used to do anything, I used to take photos, A, because I was proud of it, or because I wanted to sort of um, keep a record of everything I did. And this started way back when. And so YouTube became like a natural progression. Now, I wasn't really sort of an early adopter, believe it or not, but I was asked by a couple of other channels to make videos early on. And it's before I really had my eye on the ball when it comes to YouTube. And um, from that, my sort of name was out there if you like and um the, my, i decided to make my own youtube channel and follow some of the work that i do but it wasn't i mean it's not the whole media side of the construction industry wasn't new to me because i was fortunate enough to be um as you said mike I'm, i love my roofs and it's through my love for roof construction and framing that i began to get a little bit of a reputation in the trade for a speed accuracy and also technique. So um, I had this kind of bed already of, of, of followers, if you like, people via sort of traditional media. That was a, a good place for me to start, basically. If someone's looking for roof tips, it's a great it's a great resource. Among other things, there's a lot of neat stuff there. Thanks, mate. Yeah, yeah. Um, and so is that you know that's that's got to be a lot of added work to your day. I mean, you're already running a company, you're already trying to get work done, and now you have to record all this stuff. How does that work? Yeah, it's quite stressful. And um, I think that, well, it's, it's, it's tough because I want to record content and I want to make content, but equally, I've got to earn a living and keep my face clean. I need to make sure that the guys are being productive, the clients are paying the right money for the work. And also my clients, if they see us keep stopping and putting a camera on a tripod and doing something, they're going to get frustrated for every day. They think that the job should have been finished. They're going to look Mm. back and think if you didn't spend so much time filming, our job would be finished. So I have to balance that all the time um, with getting the job done. So there are some days where we'll produce something and we really wish we'd have filmed it. And there's other days Mm. we'll, we'll get the camera out and film something and think, I wish I'd never bothered sort of thing. So yeah, it's a really tough one. Mm. Yeah, I bet. And uh, yeah, well, the clients, you know, if they want to, if they want to go with someone who's not a famous YouTube star, they have the option, I guess. Right. Um. Well, I mean, it, it is, I suppose one of the upsides of being a contractor and being out there on YouTube is the fact that I do get approached by customers and people who are very motivated to get a proper job done, which is what mm-hmm. I want to do. And so um, it is an advantage. But saying that, as and when, I still sort of try to pick the right types of work for us, whether it's the location, the type of client, the, 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 about, the, the sort of the amount of money in the, in the contract, if you like. It doesn't want to be too big. And equally, it doesn't need to be too small. It just needs to fit our brief, if you like. And I don't mm-hmm. like being stuck on the same job for too long, that's for sure. Mm-hmm. So it's a partnership. It's a partnership between my clients and myself, they're going to get like my devotion as uh, high standards and equally in return, I need to use their job for content. So it's a bit of a partnership. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I love, I love building and talking about how to build and stuff. And, uh, you know, but I've decided to do this podcast about how to run a construction business. Kind of boring, isn't it? Well, actually I think that it's, it's in, in the case of the UK, Um, If you take the construction industry in the UK as a pyramid, at the very top of the pyramid, there's around about 50 very big companies. Mm -hmm. Those companies um, are basically employing via subcontractors, 
via sub subcontractors, via sole traders, independent tradesmen. They employ a massive part of the industry through all these sort of loose arrangements. They don't employ any tradespeople. They've got lots of clerical staff and office staff. But actually, the guys that are building the houses, building the offices, building the factories and shopping centres, and uh, are like me, a self-employed craftsman, OK, because they don't want to employ us, OK? They just want us as self-employed subbies. And so it's a very fragmented industry. Then you've got a big band of what we call SMEs, which are basically sort of small partnerships, employees up to, say, 50 employees. And there's around about 120 to 150,000 of those size contractors. Then underneath that, there's the army, the millions, probably three or four million people who are tradesmen, who are potentially uh, self-employed surveyors and, and, and all that sort of stuff. So it's a very... A very interesting industry in the UK. Very, very fragmented. But I, I kind of want to go back to your the media stuff you're doing, and, and you also have a podcast called Fix Radio. So well, how yeah. You... Go ahead. Sorry, Mike. So, um, okay. So, Fix Radio is a radio station started by a young guy called Louis Timpany. Timpany, sorry. He's a really nice guy. They asked me to do it. It's a radio station which is aimed just at the building community. It's mm-hmm. the first big type in the UK, and he's got big ideas. He wants to take it everywhere. Now, he approached me a couple of years ago when they first kicked off and said, oh, we'd love you to do a carpentry show. And I was like, never heard of you. I said, I'm, I'm not doing it. I, I'm too busy doing other things. Never heard of you. I said, thanks ever so much for asking. Anyway, so th- th- it sort of went on a bit. And then he came back to me about a year ago same question he says oh we're doing really well now we're in two major cities we've got our licenses in these cities we've got um good listenership would you do it for us and I said um oh, I'm really not I'm really not sure about this and then I said I'll give you three months so that, so then I began doing a weekly show for the first three months I said we'll have a review after three months and um I particularly liked Louis, I like the way he operates. He's a really nice guy. He's got a good, um, I said, bedside manner. If you know what I mean, he's a good. He's a good. He, he, he's honest. He's and so I just thought he's a good guy. I work with him. So that's how that came about. And I really actually enjoy it. I've learned a lot about radio and broadcasting. And indeed, they turn these into podcasts. So in terms of collateral for me and intellectual property, obviously it, it's good because. It's, it's out there and it's out there for good, so to speak. A bit like yours, Mike. You know, you're building this portfolio of um, podcasts to businesses and it's so useful to hear each other's um, experiences. Yeah, absolutely. I agree with that. Um, so one of the things I heard on your kind of introduction to Fix Radio, the introduction to you, which I really liked uh, hearing, uh, was how how you said it was really hard to go off on your own, and and the parallels to my own experience are very apparent when I listen to that, uh, and and a lot of my guests, uh, it's one of the greatest things that I've discovered with the show is that we all really went through hard times at the beginning, um, and can you talk a little bit more about that, like, you know, going off on your own and and creating your own business. Well, I mean, it, it was kind of accidental. So I was at college in 1986 when I started my carpentry and joinery apprenticeship. And it was a sort of three year course. And I had to have a sponsor, someone who was prepared for me to go on site with and do my site work experience, which was all part of the qualification. So um, I had a guy who I've been working with at weekends since I was a young kid, you know, doing labouring work, mixing concrete and all the rest of the stuff, carting stuff around, lugging stuff around, walking his dog, whatever he made me do. And then um, he was my sponsor and I started with him. And after a couple of months, I realised I'm not going to cut any timber with him. All I'm going to do is, is mixing concrete. So I left him. College said to me, you've got a week to find a new employer. So I had to trawl the phone books, which was what we used to have in the day before the Internet. And I must have phoned about 50 companies. It was a real blow to my confidence um, because people would just slam the phone down on you, not interested. All I was saying is, I'd, you don't have to pay me. I'll make my own way. You just have to let me come to work so I can carry on with my college. Anyway, cut a long story short, I managed to go through my time with this firm, really entrepreneurial guy called Brian Jones. And he, he gave me a lot of space to sort of grow, practice my craft. He just wanted the jobs done. And... Then the recession came. So in the, ninth, in the early 90s, 
the big recession came, the big sort of fallback, and mm -hmm. it decimated the industry. And the work just dried up overnight, literally overnight. And I had no choice to be self-employed because I was just looking for a day's work here, a couple of days work there, you know, networking. And I was a young 21, 22 year old. Uh, I had to pay my rent. I had to pay my bills. I had to pay for my car and all the rest of it, buy my tools. And it was a matter of accidentally getting into business. And I can remember going to the bank and the, the cashier saying to me, I'm paying some money and a little bit of money I had after a job. And they said, oh, you know, um, uh, what do you do? I said, oh, I'm a carpenter. And they said, are oh, you um, self-employed? I said, I suppose I am. They said, well, you need a business account. So it, was all, it sort of just, it just happened like that. I would have just muddled along. And um, I then had to get a bookkeeper and all the rest of it. And there was no way after that I was going to be an employee because I'd had a taste of this kind of, um, you know, this is quite good. It's hard work, but I can work for him this week. I can work for them that week. I can find my own work by a little adverts and all the rest of it. So I kind of fell into business, if you like, by accident. My first love was to craft carpentry and joinery. And I still consider that to be my first love. The, the business is an, is an accidental problem that you end up having because you are a business. You know? An accidental problem. I love it. Yeah. And I, I, I would agree. My, my experience was an accident as well. I would have not thought I was going to be a self-employed contractor. I wouldn't, I would have never dreamed I'm who I am today, 20 years ago, even, but um, yeah, that you can't go back once you, once, no. once, once those, once the wheels start turning in that direction. So. I know. And, and it's really difficult because as you know, I, I, I don't know if it's the same for you guys, but um, you know, you don't get, any pay if you're not working you're not producing you're not getting paid so when we take a holiday you've got to think can I afford to take time off let alone buy a holiday you know um it's not like I've got mates that are in proper jobs I say proper jobs you know they're in yeah. um you know they're IT directors and things like this and yeah. they earn telephone numbers you know and they have six weeks paid holiday and if they if they're feeling poorly they think I'm not going to go in today and I think to myself, I've never been able to do that. If I wake up in the morning and I've got a sore throat, a bad back, a twisted ankle, I think I can limp in because I need to go in. Because at the end of the week, I need to make my bills. You know, I got yeah. no choice. I got to do it. You know. Yeah, no doubt. Yeah, and we don't have that six-week paid leave thing going on around here either. That's pretty. That's pretty nice. But yeah, as a self-employed person, you are definitely just on your own. Yeah, so I mean, I know you want to talk about labour, and I could. Uh, I've got loads of questions for you uh, at representing the American uh, business community as well. But I mean, I don't want to jump the gun, so I'll let you, I'll let you carry okay. on where you're at. Well, where? All right. So you 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 accidentally fell into the business. You're a tradesman. You're a skilled carpenter. I mean, that's kind of where I was at, and then it it, it went in a direction, and then employees came. So how did how did how did you deal with that? Because that was another that was a huge um hurdle for me Making well i mean i mean the th the whole area around self-employment and employees if you like or taking people on you know it's like so you, so as a contractor i was doing small carpentry and joinery work roof construction small joinery packages fitting joinery for companies as well so i was doing all kinds of things and i obviously needed a pair of hands so i had a guy who was my kind of driver laborer and he was always with me. And then I needed a pair of skilled hands. And so I started looking for other carpenters to help me. And so I started bringing them in. And they were all on a casual self-employed basis because I didn't know how long I'd need them or, you know, and it sort of evolved. So as I, I mean, the first guy that came with me, a guy called Dave, he was um, 20 or 30 years older than me. He time served because of the recession. He'd lost his job. He'd always been an employee, a proper carpenter employee for a big firm. Because of the recession, he lost his job. I put an advert in the local paper saying Carpenter wanted. And, and what used to happen in the UK, you'd always publish the, how much you'd pay per day. You'd put Carpenter, Surrey, 80, 85 pounds per day. That would be it. And your phone number. And so they straight away, they'd know it's 85 pounds a day on that job or whatever. And so he'd, he, I can remember him phoning me and saying, I want, it's not enough for me. It's, I want a bit more. I said, well, that's what I'm paying. So, you know, that's, and that's how it used to be. Easy come, easy go. My late father-in-law, who was a fabulous bricklayer, used to teach me because I, I sort of grew up around him and his uh, guys who were a few generations on from me. 
he used to teach me all about you know how things work. It's easy come, easy go. You know, don't expect a job on Monday. If, you know, they might be happy on Friday, but they might have no work on Monday. So, so the whole employee thing was I had casuals and I sort of grew and I expanded and contracted. And it wasn't until these small jobs that I was doing grew into bigger jobs with bigger corporate clients like local authorities and that sort of stuff. I ended up having to have like proper employees. So I went into a position in around about the, the early sort of, I suppose it was around about 97, 98. I started having a little office. I had a, a young lady who was doing the admin side. My accountant, my then accountant was, was kind of in business with me. So we were trying to grow the business um, and we had proper employees. And it was a nightmare. It was an absolute nightmare because the model didn't fit the marketplace, if you like. I wanted to become a bona fide contracting business with proper employees, giving them all of the things they needed, like vehicle, holiday pay, you know, and all the rest of the things to, to make it work. Yet my clients, um, I was pricing work. So I said, the job's 50K. And yet, would I be able to deliver it for 50K based on the business model that I've got? And it was really, really difficult. So a few years of, of doing that and then discovering, actually, I'm much better off to, to be out on there on the tools with a few subcontractors, outsourcing a bit of work, if you know what I mean. So it was a very interesting journey. And, and I learned so much from that, especially from running a business in, in the UK. It, it evolves every year, too, right? Every year is a little bit different in the direction, what you want, how you want to staff or or fill those gaps with subcontractors, depending on where the work is going. And, and having the full-time crew all the time can be really challenging if, because you have to keep, you have to keep yeah. employees busy the yeah. exact amount of hours they want to work because they don't want to live your lifestyle. No, and, wanna... and, no, no. And also, and also with all due respect to, um, the difference between an employee and a self-employed person is the self-employed person generally um, has, has, has a target to me because they, I said, right, this is the job that's, that's, um, you know, and I give them a price for it. So I say, let's yes, agree a price. They might say, I'm going to build that roof or that hang those doors and it's going to be 1,200. And I'll say, fine, I agree it. And they go, so if they do it in three days, brilliant. If they do it in 10 days, that's not my problem. We've agreed a price. If it's an employee, they think, right, oh, get up, oh, oh yeah, get to work. I think we'll have a cup of tea. Oh, yeah. And then they what basically what they end up doing is, 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 is just going to work to get through the day as opposed to going to work to get work finished. And with all due respect to people who are employed, the targets or the goals don't seem to be the same. And and that's not their fault. It's, it's, it's the way, our, you know, people operate. If, for example, everything you say, well, you're an employee and you earn X, but if you your bonus is if you do this, 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 and this, but that's too complicated for a small contracted business. Yeah. And that's one of the, the things a, a, an employer needs to learn or a self-employed person is that you can't, you can't expect your employees to be you, right? Because you start estimating time based on how things, how you do things and, and you just get it wrong because, because their goal is the paycheck. And your goal yeah. is a different thing. I mean, I'm not saying that they don't want your company to do great. My everybody I've ever had work with me has been great and wants the company to go to be better, but it's different. They have, I have a vested interest as yeah. opposed to, you know, I just needed a job where I like mm -hmm. working. So I think I think our industry, especially the, the construction industry, especially the smaller end, is is very unique in the business world. It's a little, I suppose, it's a little bit like motor mechanics. Anywhere where you've got to physically produce to do something, you you know, you can't. No one gets paid for thinking time, you know, and all that sort of stuff. You've got to factor that into the price. It's it is it is really difficult, you know. It's, you know, if the rain rains and you don't get the work done, you know, no one's going to pay you for that. It's uh, it's a nightmare. Um, yeah, I, I couldn't agree more. And so another thing I heard when, when you were talking about setting up your business, it's something that really resonated with me. It's, it's not doing things, walking away from doing things that seem like they'll be free and moving on from customers 
that are unwilling to pay for skill and experience. It's kind of double. That's kind of two two statements in one. But yeah, I, I think it's a really interesting point because I've got mates who I've worked with, and then they've gone off on their own. They started the business, and I can see exactly what they're doing and where I was at the same point in my career. And so I tried to help them a bit, like them listening to a podcast such as this. So I would say to them, look. Focus on what it is you really, really, really like doing. Don't take on things you really don't like doing because your heart's not going to be in it. Also, try to get the right types of clients. If you don't like a particular area, don't work in that area because it's all of the things that, you know, it, it is not going to be good for your business. And, you know, there are going to be times where you're going to go and price a job. And my, my, my aim now in life is to price condition everyone. I cannot afford hours or days or evenings to sit back put a comprehensive bid together for someone to say, that's way too much money. I need to be able to look them in the eye when I meet them and, and see, are these people likely to be able to afford what they want done? Do they understand what they want to have done? And can they afford me? And so by the time I leave, we have nice conversations. I will evaluate all of that and I'll even tell them roughly what ballpark they're in just to see their expressions. And if they go, so let's give you an example. So I turn up, and a guy wants to take a, a, put a big addition on his house, an extension. He also wants to excavate a basement and he wants to put a double garage on the side of the plot. So straight away, I think, right, we've got a couple of 300K for that. We've got a couple of 100K for that. We've got 100K for that. And I think so. So I straight away, and I'll, I will say to him, talk through it, you know, sh show my experience a little bit without giving too much away. And then say, right, this based on something I've done very similar to this, and that project was was half a million and watch the color of their eyes and see their expression. If, for example, they go, oh, it's way more than I want to spend. Brilliant. Well, then they, they then, then I'm probably not the right person. Or they need to, to shrink their aspiration a little bit because that's where they're starting. Or if they go, that's great. How could how quickly can you firm up your figures? I know straight away it's worth me going away, sitting down, putting a little bit more flesh on the bones, not going too mad on the spec or you know or, or even a schedule of any sort getting it back to them and saying this is what i'm looking at do you want to work together to work up a schedule now and and, and take it a little bit further i see it now as a partnership between the client and me as a contractor and my my resources which i treasure my my, my people my suppliers I treasure the relationships I've forged with them and I'm going to pass them on to my customer, you know, without yeah. them doing any work. It's taken me 30 years to grow that, you know? Definitely. And uh, for everybody out there uh, listening, I was nodding aggressively in agreement throughout that whole <laughs> uh, little passage there. And, and yeah, that sussing out who's, actually going to pay for work is huge. I, I mean, I, I have so many things I try in the, when they call, if I've never heard of them, I'm trying to figure out on the phone, do I even want to go to their house mm. and meet with them? Because, because often people aren't prepared and that's not always, that's not their fault. A lot of people just don't know, but you have to find a line between how much we are willing to educate people for free too, or just walking mm. away and let them figure out more on their own. Uh, I, I don't know whether you have the I don't know whether you have the problem uh, in the US, uh, North America, with regard to we have lots of property programs. It seems to be on the television. We have lots of property programs. They're all experts, and they all go, "Oh yeah, you know this house. Need, if we put a little extension on here, it's like this is the TV company, you know the, the presenters, and they're saying for sixteen thousand you could create this." And I'm shouting at the TV, going, "You haven't got a clue what that's going to cost." Oh, and yet. So they're telling sort of 3 million viewers that actually that extension or that conversion would only cost you 10,000 or something. So when they come to us and they say, and you say it's 30, they say, oh, and then they have the cheek to say, oh, he's really expensive. How do they know I'm expensive or not? You know, right? they don't know. what They, they have got no idea. They've never done a day's work in their lives. You know, they, they, they think that um, we're just out to rob them. Yeah. Well, A, yeah. If, so, if you know, if someone says you're too expensive, I'm like, good. Go find, go find someone else then. That's oh, no. if you want to say, if you want to say that. Go find the cheaper guy who will tell you it's half as much as I said, and then actually end up charging you more than what I said because he didn't know what he was doing. Oh, no. But, but the yeah, the TV thing, the television shows, 
um, all the all the new programs about property and stuff definitely set some crazy expectations, especially for timing. People think yeah. something's going to take three weeks, and it's like, no, the dr- the drywall takes three weeks. You have to hang it. It gets wet. It has to dry, and then you paint it. It takes time, you know. And and so people don't understand, and and the and the programs are definitely setting bad expectations. They are. And I mean, everyone knows in the UK, people say that the jobs go like 100% over budget and 50% over time or 100% over budget and 100% over time. And in a lot of cases, that's true because, you know, I mean, people are just plucking figures out of the air, even contractors. I know so many jobs. I think I price, let's say I've had, had, a, had a, a look at a job and I think, yeah, I think that's going to be two and a half. And I have a conversation, like I'm saying, price condition them. I get the, oh, no, we've had another price and it's far less. And I think, oh, good luck to them. I can't physically do it. They're either using cheap labor or they, or they haven't got a clue and they're just, they're just going to go under and they're going to start up again and roll it on and the rest of it. And this is what happens all the time. And then I drive past a job and they say, oh, I say, I'm going to do it in a year. And they say, oh, we've had someone to do it six months. And 18 months later, they're still not finished. And I think to myself, blimey, you know, th- th- I could have told you this was going to happen. They just don't listen to you. I, I agree. And, but the good thing about that, right, is that, you know, we've been, it sounds like you and I both have been giving straight numbers. They're honest from the start. You, it's a really realistic number. And if the person doesn't like it because they think it's too high and they go with someone else, they often will see later that you are totally right. Mm. And they should have gone with you. And, and now they're in a project that is being mismanaged and going over budget and uh, because someone, you know, your, your numbers are, if, if I give a number for a job and one of my friends that is a contractor here is a number for a job, we're pretty much going to be super similar in our price. Mm-hmm. And if a client can't see that a reputable builder mm-hmm. is, is, you know, not giving a, mm. or giving a number that mm. Mm. D- they don't understand. I, that's going to be on them, basically. It, uh, it, ama- it amazes me when you can, um, what I tend to do, if it's, um, you know, a, a fairly big job, I use a, I outsource the number crunching. They'll do the quantities. They'll take off all the quantities. They'll say, you're going to need 15,000 bricks. You're going to need 200 sheets of drywall in your, there's another thing, drywall, plasterboard, we call it not drywall what's all this drywall thing <laughs> yeah plasterboard and um so so you know all the rest of it and so so i will have a schedule of everything that's been taken off by computer to their drawings and it's very very accurate i can also set my labor rates based on those uh you know those those tasks if you like making the roof building the foundations blah, 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 all the rest of it and i can table that to the client and say okay they're the numbers and here's my margin I, I'm working on 25% at the moment profit margin to allow for a buffer for the trade, the fluctuation in prices of materials and this and this and this. And when I show that to a professional person, they appreciate that because very, very few contractors will do that. What it, what it invites them to do is go back to their other prices. Someone might say, if I say it's 250K and of that 50K is profit, and the 50 days profit is because I'm a business and because I need to have a buffer because sometimes it takes longer and I'm not going to pass that on to you and all the rest of it. And if they're business people, they respect that. They, they, they will appreciate that I need to earn a profit. I need to make some money. I need to pay my bills and have a little mm-hmm. bit left. You know, but a lot of contractors don't even think of the P word. They don't think of profit. They just think of time. And yet, they have every right to they have every right to make them make some money as their as a business. You have to. We put in so much time. There's way too much effort going into it not to profit. When you are pre- presenting the information in a really digestible way, that and straight looking people straight in the eye and saying this is what I need to make, they respect that. But it ta- it can it does take years, right, to have enough of those kind of clients coming to you. Yeah, you know, it, 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 it does. It does. It does take it years. Doesn't happen, and, it doesn't happen right away. No, it, it does take years. And you can kiss a lot of frogs before, you know, you think you find your prince, as it were. But, um, yeah, I, I do. I do think that it's 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 a bit of an art, really, to be honest. <laughs> it is. Absolutely. One of the things I also really appreciated moving on from 
from this little aspect uh, is that you emphasize uh, getting, you know, your use, getting useful tools to improve efficiency, though you said you're kind of a self-proclaimed technophobe, kind of averse to buying new tools because you've got stuff that works. I like that because I'm kind of the same way as opposed to a lot of people now just, you know, it's upgrade, upgrade, upgrade. Yeah. And I've, yeah, I mean, I mean, let, let's be honest. I mean, I, I could, uh, you know, when I look at my my current kit of tools, now I'm very, very fortunate because the big powers to be in the power tool world, they 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 gladly pass stuff over to us to look at, to try, and all the rest of it. So I do have a lot of kit, but I, equally, I I do turn a lot of kit down because I don't want any more kit. But there, I mean, some of my kit is ten or fifteen years old and still working perfectly. But the new modern replacements are brilliant but I'm, I'm fine with what i've got i think you're right you can go and get absolutely masses of new kit and all the rest of it but it's not going to make your work any better it might speed things up slightly but to be honest it's like when i started out we had hardly any of this gear nothing was battery everything was mains and we we'd have about six power tools that would be it. a range would be around about six power tools now people have a truckload of power tools to do every single job yeah, I I had three to five employees for a while there. So I've got a trailer full of power tools. I've got a lifetime supply. I've got so much stuff that for one guy now, I mean. Nice. I, I, I yeah, it is pretty, it's pretty nice. But I'm, I, I'm fully with that buying tools, that, anything to improve your efficiency. But, you know, I, I hold back for a minute and see where, where technology is going before. Yeah, absolutely. Well, there's some amazing things coming and, uh, and some things come from your side over this way and some things come from the Far East and all the rest of it and Germany. There's some amazing stuff coming through uh, at the moment and the technology is mind blowing. So, yeah, I mean, it's, it's an exciting thing to the point where there will be things that you will have to have to compete to make sure you can do it accurately and efficiently. So that's where I think it's going to be. And what would you say? in running your business is your greatest asset if you were to um i just I, well it's a difficult one really in terms of my the greatest asset i think technology in terms of e-commerce so email texting whatsapp and having everything in the palm of your hand which if you break that device you can just reboot a new one and it will all be on that new one i think that's the greatest asset now whereas before you might have a word processor or a computer to make the odd document or do some basic accounting mm. now everything we need at all is on your device it's with you wherever you are which is sometimes a bad thing when you want a bit of time off but you have to ignore it um but i do think that yes it's it's that side of things now that you can get an inquiry you can have a quick look at it you can bin it you can contact them back whereas when i started out it was a landline and an answer machine. And if you, you know, yep. someone would phone, leave a message, you'd get in, you'd be so tired, you'd pick up the messages, you'd have to take a pen, write down the message, yeah, write down the number, and then phone them back like this, phone them back using the old phone, and hopefully they'd be in. And then you'd have to say, you know, can I come and see you? Write down the address. Now everything's ping that across to me sat that over, yeah. blast over, and, and everything. Uh, you could stand there on site and say to the client, this is what we've discovered under your floor. Show them, put the phone, show it to them live. You know, this is the greatest thing that's ever happened to me as a contractor, being able to just, there's no excuses, nowhere to run, there's no escape, there's nowhere to hide, even with your suppliers. You know, everyone now, if they, they can't say we haven't got it. I can check your stock myself to see if you've right. got it, you know? Yeah. Yeah, that's it is a great one. My I I when my it took a while for my crew to all have smartphones, but once that was on and we could they could text me a picture of the problem cuz I'm not always on site. I'm just driving around buying stuff and bringing it back. That was a huge that was a huge game changer for me. But yes, back in the day, wait going and checking your answers. You didn't have to drive home to check mm. your messages. Like you had to go home after work right away. 
I know, I know. But I've always been an early, ado- I've always been an early adopter. So in, in 19, I was 18, 1988, I got my first mobile phone. And I can remember my father-in-law uh, saying to me, what do you need that for? Who do you think you are? Sort of thing. Who do you think you are? You're one of these city, you're a, you're a carpenter. You don't need that. I said, look, I said, I could put a little advert in. People can phone me. Who's, no one's going to phone a mobile because then it was like, you know, it was, it was years ago in the UK. If you only had a mobile number in an advert, they'd think you were a cowboy. <laughs> we call them a, we call them a cowboy. Now people expect to be able to contact you via mobile phone and no one has a landline. I mean, I have a landline. Very few people have a landline. That's it. Do you have a rotary dial phone still? Nah, no. not anymore. Ah. Uh disappointed um <laughs> and then oh what so what would be your your greatest personal asset you got the we got in, the mobile okay um well, that's an interesting question mike in terms of personal asset give me an idea of yours and then i'll be able to tell you what mine is. I, I would say that my strong my my greatest strength or asset is just being being able to organize like bring everything together mm, okay yeah i reckon that is learned behavior. And I think I've, I've cracked that now. Um, my, one of my greatest assets now, I heard you mention that, you know, you, you go off and drive around, pick things up. Now, what I tend to do, and I made a pact with myself that I would never leave site to go and get anything. Uh, so basically means I've always got what I need two weeks time on being delivered to site. So my, my greatest organization as, asset, if you like, is making sure I'm thinking three weeks, four weeks, five weeks, six weeks ahead, and it's there. And I think that I've, uh, since, since mastering that, I've become even more super efficient to the fact where I can actually um, produce uh, to my program, if you like, without struggling, thinking, oh, no, because you'd ever factor in nipping off to get another, uh, some more lumber. I think you call it lumber. We call it timber. But you go get some lumber or something, you know. Yeah, we get lumber. Um. Yeah. And I, yeah, I agree. Having everything on site is the way to go. I, I just, I, once I had full-time crew, I pretty much decided that they work and I run the, I, I'm pretty much running the business. Cause I, I had a lot of jobs where I was managing without my employees. So I'm, I was doing a lot of site visits and I had to be in a lot of places every day. Mm. Um, I don't do it that way anymore, but uh mm. Yeah, there was a there was a period where I'd you know be doing seven or eight job or site visits a day. Bonnie. So, yeah, a lot of driving, a lot of taking notes, and phone calls. Um, so let's talk about the labor shortage and labor. Mm-hmm. Um, we are incredibly shorthanded where I live, and I know every every everybody I talk to in the world. Yeah. Does the same thing. Yeah, I, I think I think it's been a perfect storm. Now, um, so so our experiences in in the UK. This is what happened since I've been in the trade since the early or since the mid eighties when I started as an apprentice. So there was a lot of people being trained, and it was um, it was like the colleges were getting fed lots of um, students, if you like, who weren't maybe. Uh, academically bright enough to go to university university wasn't fashionable it was for the elite it was for the middle classes for the grammar school kids and over and so we were pushed like I was pushed towards a manual job it was a mechanic it was a carpenter a bricklayer a plasterer and all the or a drywaller and all that sort of stuff and then the recession came and a lot of that training got cut and a lot of people and straight away the builders stopped working and and all the self-employed people lost money. And a lot of people said to their children, don't ever be a builder. It's not very, you know, it's not a good business to be in. If you're not working, go and get a job in computing and all the rest of it. So it became an unsexy profession if it ever was sexy. OK, it became something not to aspire to. And then we had a massive influx of labour. We had labour coming out of our ears as the EU started opening up and we had people like migration was huge coming into the uk we had um, a huge uh, group from poland we had lithuania we had uh, romania albania every single 
every single country had, and I can understand it because they were able to come to the UK and even on the most lowest laborers' wages, they could make a good living uh, equivalent, you know? And obviously, since the EU, we, we, we've left the EU, it's, 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 you know, there's been a fair amount of people go back, but that's not contributed massively. It has, it has contributed. But what's happened here since lockdown and, and the virus, people have been doing their houses up. They're not going to work. They've been staying at home. They can't go on holiday. They're just doing their houses up. They're thinking, well, this is a solid asset. We need the space. We need a garden room to work from home. And they've been pumping money into, into property. And mm -hmm. the labour has disappeared a bit. And, and, not, and it's not easy to come now if you're in the EU. It's not easy to come do works or the rest of it. So people are um, finding that. So, 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 so it's, it's really created a problem. Now, there's always been decent labour shortages because of the lack of training, because of the influx of, of, of lots of uh, foreign labour and also pushing the prices down making people think actually you know i mean i was earning as a carpenter when i was 20 i was earning about 100 pounds a day okay that was in 1990 and then it grad it was always going up by five pounds a day per year that's what it seemed like so by the time about 96 before i started my sort of bigger contracting business with the office and, and tanya and the girl also, i was on about 160 now then then the money stayed at 160 it, as, as people come over, it never grew because it, we had another late late nineties. We had another recession, um, and it all sort of went a bit bit wrong again. And it, it, they stayed there ever since. And it's only now, in the last twelve to eighteen months, where the labour rates are getting back to where they should be. If you're a time served tradesman or a small business, you've got your own tools and transport. You can read a drawing and deliver a project or product then you can go and command the right money and i'm not talking about fortunes i'm just saying that you can go and command enough to make you have a half decent living to be able to afford a decent mortgage to buy a house what you're generally building for other people so it's it's on one hand yes the labor shortage is problematic but what i do with my clients is i tell them where the tight squeezes are in labor before we start so example i might say we're all right on groundworks because we can mechanically do a lot of that. We're all right with brick layers because we've got someone who always does our work and we look after them. But there are things like decorators, tilers for bathrooms, floors and walls. There are even scaffolders. It's been hard to find a scaffold firm to do work for us and all the rest of it in certain locations. So I highlight the problems and I say these are the things that are going to add to the time frame on the job. And I think mm -hmm. that that's need to do manage the expectations i think yeah managing expectations is is key that's definitely one of the main things i emphasize in the show um and and what sort of so are you you're not seeing like young people wanting to go into trades as much i mean that's it's i feel like i feel like here since since 2008 you know when the economy crashed in 08, it was the housing industry that did it. So no one wanted to go. No one was like, oh, I want to go be a carpenter or, a, you know, mm. or get involved in re residential construction. And so I think that was a huge contributor here. Um, but we. Yeah. I'd, yeah. I, 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 I mean, the subprime thing um, from America, and I mean, it affected the whole global, you know, everything was overpriced and money. They were selling loans and all the rest of it. And the housing market was at the, the, the forefront of that, if you know what I mean. It's like, a, yeah, it was right. just, it just, it just blew up. And, but, but I think in the last five years, since Instagram, especially, and YouTube, and the ease of communicating with vast amounts of people for people like me i can sort of talk to seventy thousand people plus the other people who are not you know and i can talk to whoever I, you know i've got a, a good following thank goodness and i'm trying to make it a really interesting place to be i'm working with the institute of carpenters to try and grow the whole carpentry community here in the uk and indeed across the world you know and, and, and i'm i'm so happy that the amount of um, pictures i get sent to me from people, uh, youngsters, you know, who are starting out there at college. I gave an award uh, recently at a college for the third year carpenter of the year. And it was so brilliant turning up, seeing these enthusiastic youngsters and the work they're producing and their lecturers. And I felt that there's a resurgence going on here in the UK 
of trades and mm. it's, it's brilliant. And I think hopefully fast forward 10 years, I think that it will be as respected an occupation as it is in other parts of the world, such as Germany, where trades people are admired as much as lawyers and doctors. That's great to hear. Uh, I, I haven't heard a lot of good news coming anywhere about about young people getting into trades. It definitely wasn't emphasized enough uh, when I was growing up. And it was a fallback. Mm, definitely. So, where I live, uh, I keep saying this on the show, people are going to get tired of me saying it, but where I live, builders and tradesmen are pretty well revered. But it's like where I live is kind of the, the frontier. So a lot of people build their own homes and a lot of, you know, it's it's a very outgoing community here. So, so when when you say revered, what what what, what do you mean? By, they, by people revered? really, if you can build, people really respect it. And, oh, really? And, yeah. Yeah. yeah, I mean, that, everybody yeah, wants a great. home. Yeah, yeah, I suppose that's great. I mean, I do feel, I do feel, um, I do think we're revered by people who are interested, uh, actually, you know, I, I must admit that. But um, in the UK, the house prices are so, so expensive, especially in the southeast. You know, it's kind of like, um, yeah, I mean, spec build. Some people spend tens of millions on building a house. Do you know what I mean? But yeah. they, those, those people don't revere the workers that are doing the household and they see us mm. as a real problem. They see us as the, uh, you know, the, the issue or, 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 you know, it's a nightmare. Yeah. So, um, yeah, but other people do respect, respect us, I think. Yeah. I think, well, there's always going to be some class issues. I mean, yeah. we'll, we'll never get away from some level of, of class, class issues. It's just the way it is. In the past, I think the the kind of demonization of trades or looking down upon it really contributed to um, what's going on now. Yeah, absolutely. I, I must admit, I used to have a little bit of a chip on my shoulder because um, I, I I had a job in Regent Street in London. It's like one of the busiest thoroughfares in the country. It's a beautiful place, and I had a shop fitting job. I was in my sort of mid twenties. And I was the uh, what we call site agent or the person running the job. And on the, I was the carpenter, head carpenter, but also head tradesman. I was looking after the whole job. And it was a really stressful existence. And I was using the train to go up and back. And I can remember sitting on the train you know, in, my, in my work gear and, and seeing people look at me, like look down on me as if say, oh, don't sit too close to me. You know, dusty and all that stuff, you know. And yet another day, if I was going out for a meeting, because I've always had other businesses, you know, going on side sort of thing, construction related. I'd have a suit on, a tie, and I'd be on the same train. They'd take no notice of me. And I used to think, what, you know, what is the difference between me wearing my my, my dirties, if you like, my workwear, and me sitting here? And I used to get really frustrated about that because I thought to myself, you know, you've got no idea about me. You're judging me because I look like I'm a manual worker sort of thing. But I've lost that now. I, I just don't want the train anymore. Yeah, I, I, I recently was on a, on a podcast called Bread to Build, and they asked me, you know, what my message to the next generation would be. And I, I said not to take things too personally because, because that chip on the shoulder is there for a lot of people, a lot of, a lot of young people in trades. But, you know, there's a, there, it was a systemic failure that brought us to this. And so the, you know, you're not necessarily being judged. It's just people don't under, always understand what's going on around them. And and everybody's having their own experience, you know. You, you can't really worry uh, about you can't really worry about what someone else thinks or how they're looking at you. They might not even be looking at you like that. And that's the thing is that that mentality, if you let it get inside of you, can really really snowball and, and, and affect so much more of your life and you just have to let it go. Who cares? Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. What else would you want to tell the world today? Or do you have anything more to comment on on labor and, and what's going um, on? I do, I, do, I do think that thanks to YouTube, Instagram, and also, you know, the, the whole social media thing and how easy it is to communicate. I think that it's going to be great for the industries. And, it's, and, and as you say, Mike, it's, it's, we're a global family. Whether you work with your hands, you build. We're a global family. We do something which is transferable across the world. And our skills, how we build in the UK and how you may build in the US and how someone may build in India, we can all learn from each other. And hopefully 
from learning from each other and from showing each other different techniques and trying different ways, we will hone our skills and we will be able to meet all of these things that we need to, all the challenges, climate resilient, we need houses that aren't going to blow over, we need houses that aren't going to be bad for the environment. And I think that we'll accelerate there. And a, a global a standard of construction is achievable. And I think that, you know, it, uh, that's, I think Labour is, we're all going to become like a great big global team, hopefully. Yeah, worldwide construction tribe. Exactly. And we're all experts where we live at how we build. The struggles in the background are the same, not that different. There's a couple of different words we use as we've mm-hmm. come across there, but but you know the business side is so similar no matter where we are. Do you think that people should go to their podcast platform and give us a five star review? I, th- I think I think that um, this is again back harping back to the whole fantastic world we have of social media and, and access to information. I mean, if for example you can relate to what Mike and I are saying about about running a small business in the construction industry, whether it's here in the UK or indeed North America or anywhere in the world, then I I think that it may be worthy of a five-star review if that makes all the difference. I know that that's what life's all about now. It's review, it's check, it's give a star and it's all the rest of it, like, press and all this. Subscribe. Hashtag subscribe. subscribe. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, give a, <laughs> give a five-star review for Mike's uh podcast and and um robin why don't you tell the crowd once again where they can find you and and just kind of you know give them a little a little more about what 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 you're going to offer them okay so basically i love my craft i'm a carpenter and joiner and i like to share my knowledge with the world whether you're just interested in what other people do or whether you're a carpenter or builder and you want to see how other people do things. My channel is on YouTube and it's just Robin Clever. It's my name. I'm also on Instagram exactly under the same name. So if you went to the big Google and you type Robin like the bird and Clever, which is a little bit more of a mouthful, then you'll be able to uh, find me. So there's all kinds of stuff uh, in there as well. And um I really would like to have you along for the ride. And you'll also be able to find links to all of Robin's stuff in my show notes uh, if, you, if you go there. And what about the pod? Are you going to still be doing the podcast, Robin? So, so for Fixed Radio, yes, at the moment, we've agreed uh, another further term with the radio station. And so that's all looking good. In fact, we're going to be nationwide uh, within a year or so which is a completely different ball game for me um, in terms of radio so I've got the luxury of the radio show with Louis and I appreciate that I've got the luxury of YouTube and my fantastic followers and viewers who are generally kind to me and Instagram so yeah I'll, I'll carry on with the podcast and also like you Mike you've invited me on as well and I've done a few others indeed um, I, I, I did I did one with Connor, do you know? Have you heard of Connor Crook from Diamondback Tool Belts? Oh, I, I have. Yeah, I haven't. I haven't gotten a chance to check that out yet. There's so many things to listen to yeah. and watch now. It's yeah. impossible. He, he, he's, yeah. he's, 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 amazing. he's amazing, and that's an amazing American firm. There, I tell you, you know, those guys are just entertaining, absolutely entertaining. And um, yeah, so that's been good. So I'm, I am due to a visit the U.S. and visit some of my contacts and I'm in the, and my product, one of my products I'm actually planning to launch in the U S as well. Oh, great. Cool. Um, and I'm going to, I'm going to tell everybody where they can find me again, but I, the first place I'm going to mention is the hammer app. Um, and you, they can find me on, on the hammer app at Mike Kenoki, just my name. And do you know about the hammer app? No, it sounds great. Yeah. It's just an app for your phone that it's, it's like Instagram for, trade people so it's anyone in the trades posting pictures of their work eventually it'll be used as like a as like an online cv um so contractors can go find people and hire them there but but it's really neat because you see work there that you'd never see otherwise you see pictures of things that happen behind construction fences like in the middle of the night underground and and you know stuff i wonder about but i've never been in those places. So sounds great. You guys can also find me at the contracting handbook on Instagram. 
I have a Patreon account if you want to make a donation for, for content production. And so you can also find me at the contracting And, uh, and that's it. Robin, thank you so much for being here today. It's been awesome. Uh, thank you, Mike. And thanks to everyone who may listen to this or is listening to it right now. Hey guys, it's Mike. Before I go, I want to give a shout out to Bruce Teller, my friend and teacher for over 20 years, my foreman for seven of those years. Without his patience, skill, leadership, flexibility, and eccentric behavior, I would not have been able to grow my company, Straight Ahead Construction, into what it is today. Thank you, Bruce. 